Now we're going to uh, move on to Iza Palinska. She's from Poland. She's a feminist activist, politician and publicist, and is going to talk to us about what's happening in Poland. So Iza, thank you so much for being here. Can you tell us what's going on in Poland on the issue of gender identity ideology? I will be speaking on more broad and general terms because I believe that in Poland it is still very early in this debate. We are very early in this debate. And this is mainly due to the fact that we have a very conservative uh, far-right government and the ruling party's position is still quite, um, quite strong. And I would say that we are uh, nowhere near to, to losing this conservative government, which is um, unfortunately and sadly against any minorities' rights. So they are against women's rights, but other minority groups, um, they are like um, actively against their rights also. So a radical feminist position is unfortunate because uh, when talking uh, about being against gender ideology or queer ideology, we are uh, put in the same sack with these conservatives. Uh, plus, for several e years now in Poland, we have had this um, ongoing narrative and uh, right, far-right political propaganda of gender ideology. But this gender ideology meaning something uh, different than what we are discussing now. When they were referring to gender ideology for the last five or seven years, I would say, they were mostly referring to the mm, gender critical feminist discourse that was saying that strict uh, sex roles are something that uh, is harmful for both women and societies. So um, for now, I would say it's too early for the um, general public to understand and get this difference. And for now, uh, be because we are not at risk of uh, having um, self-gender legislation like um, uh, approved in the future, in the in the foreseeable future. future. So um, for this reason, uh, the discussion that is ongoing in Poland is mostly the matter of uh, a language discussion, uh, of inclusive language, of course, because um, the trend is visible and is quite strong in liberal media and on liberal social media accounts that are um, quite totally supporting anything that goes contrary to the narratives pushed by the ruling party and the government. So when the government is against gender or gender ID, the liberal opposition will take it uh, everything to support it. Uh, without even knowing or fully understanding, understanding what stands behind that. Does the, the, the Liberal opposition also uh, take the pro-women's rights position or are they just taking the pro-trans position? Like, are they standing up for the basic, you know, women's rights? You have probably heard about uh, women's protests against this very strict anti-abortion law that was uh, applied the last year and it was called the black protest and it was huge, huge women's protest. So um, the movement unfortunately got hijacked by this um, pro queer or pro gender narratives because uh, the women's strike council even uh, prepared uh, legislation on new abortion law that was supposed to be pro-women that doesn't even include the word woman itself. Like this is the same case as in Argentina. So um, I would say that the declaratively uh, liberal opposition is very much pro-women's rights, but it's only on the surface. And when we go deeper, we can really see that um, uh, there is um, not much of 
like really understanding what women's rights are about um, deeper. Uh, plus, sadly, I have to say that most of uh, women's organizations in Poland um, are not voicing their um, support for women in this situation. Uh, they, in the best cases, stay silent in the whole discussion regarding uh, wars on language and wars with TERFs. So, and my idea would be that it's because they are afraid of, um, of losing their founding sources, which are probably not coming from the ruling government, but they are coming from somewhere abroad, some foundations that are pro-queer and pro-trans agenda. How about you, Isa? Um, have you been a feminist all your life and what made you think, realize transgenderism was a threat to women's rights? Yes, I, I can call myself a feminist since I only remember, so I am a feminist for all my life. And the more I did not see and I did not understand at first uh, what stands behind this whole conflict. And the moment that I understood was the moment that I learned about self-gender ID doctrine. So this self-gender ID doctrine applied into law made me understand in a blink of an eye <laughs> that women as a political group and a, like social group cease to exist. And that we as feminists in a sexist society cannot let it happen. Do you sort of read uh, like the internet? Like, do you get information from all over the world, or are you other places in Poland like good sites that you follow? Like the mix of news that my newsfeed on social media gives me uh, from the selected sources. Uh, however, uh, one of the first stages in, on this way was signing your declaration. So thank you very much for this, for, for preparing this document, <laughs> because it's extremely important work. And I would say that um, it's not even a matter of lack of the sources for people to understand the conflict. It's a, uh, it's a sheer disbelief that something so absurd <laughs> may be happening, in fact. So uh, each time that we are trying here in Poland to discuss this issue with so-called re regular citizens, we are met with uh, like this disbelief and this distance coming from the position that it's, it's not possible that anyone would be uh, like saying there are no such thing as two biological sexes. I think that, well, from the practical perspective, this document is, um, I think it can be applicable more to the English speaking Western world, which in many cultural stances is in different place than we are uh, with our political reality. So we have to select some pieces of it and then uh, combine it into a new narrative, which uh, happens to be um, like uh, we are happening to be organizing now. Uh, we, uh, we are quite a few in Poland, radical feminists like standing up for women and women's rights, not being sorry and not being uh, ashamed of using this word. So, um, and we are, some of us are in a quite difficult position because uh, um, my, my colleagues are crowdfunding uh, to be able to sue their haters and sue people who are responsible for, in one case, for losing um, income sources uh, from an um, Instagram influencer who became a women's rights activist. In the other case, um, the case of Ursula Kuczynska, uh, she was expelled from left-wing political party, uh, not even for like stating very uh, controversial or uh, pro-women's women supportive uh, words, but she was expelled. Even uh, it was put this way in, in this document that she was expelled for liking 
and sharing incorrect, like a, a radical feminist content on social media. So it's it's uh, quite absurd what we are experiencing now, but we are like people are, are terrified to to come up with their voices, to come up with their opinions, to take part in this discussion, because they are seeing what happens to these other women. So right at the moment, what we are doing, we are trying to like get this perspective of having our voices heard and showing them that we cannot be like um, uh, terrorized into silence. So for yeah. that... I mean, is there a thing that we've found in the UK, and I, I think other countries, but certainly in the UK where I am, is that uh, we've had some very good success with crowdfunders uh, when there's been a, a case and we when we have a good issue. Often it's law cases. Um, and so uh, Maya Forstatter, who just sort of won a recent case yes. about it being legal or it being allowed to not believe in gender identity ideology it's, it's allowed she raised um over a hundred thousand pounds uh for defending her court case and there have been a series of court cases where people have given money and i we get the feeling that there's quite a lot of people who have money but they're scared to speak but they will give money if they can and it's been a surprise sometimes that we can get we are being supported mm -hmm. so i definitely recommend giving it a try if you can because you might get it's actually helped the process of our resistance the crowdfunding because it's allowed people to support us who can't speak so it's a sort of anonymous method of support so if it it'd be interesting to see what happens when you start doing crowdfunding if more supporters come out to help you, it would be great. Well, we actually did start it already. So it's already happening and we have something like fifth, fifth part needed already gathered. However, as I mentioned, uh, your position is slightly different because we are presenting this topic to the Polish speaking audience and this Polish speaking audience who is into the topic and fami familiar with it, uh, it's it's a margin, a margin of a public in general. So there are not so many people involved, uh, eager to support the the case. But I would say that each day more, because and the the discussion and the style of this discussion that is happening online is very harsh, very aggressive. Anyone can see that women are being attacked. So people are each day more eager to support us, I would say. As we speak, I definitely understand the need to build a solidarity among us worldwide, but also I came to the conclusion that it's very, very important to build a solidarity and trust between different generations of women. And what we are lacking, especially in Poland right now, that the most popular mainstream feminists, so-called inclusive feminists, well, they are stealing young women for us. Like we cannot get their attention enough and we cannot uh, get, them, get them on our side for some reason still. But I think that working on building this, this trust between ourselves and young women is essential. 